You're listening to the BCTLE Podcast, a resource made possible by the BD Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence at Taylor University. I'm your host, Timothy Berkey. I had a conversation recently with a student about what it means to be a lifelong learner. And during the course of that conversation, as we spoke about the continual growth, the willingness to try and fail, the responsiveness to feedback, I had a realization and maybe I'm a little late to this realization, but I think at some point along the way, as I moved further into Christian higher education, I bought into the belief that my perspective on the integration of faith and my discipline or faith and pedagogy needed to be set. It needed to pass muster. It needed to arrive. But that's not true. Uh, And it's not true for the same reason that we have at the sort of center of who we are, this idea that we're developing lifelong learners. It's because our understanding of our discipline is constantly changing and growing. That's what it means to be a scholar, to contribute, to, to explore, to understand. And our understanding of our creator, something far more vast than our discipline, certainly should be growing too. And so my understanding of the integration of faith and learning is something that will evolve. It's not arrived. It doesn't have to pass muster. It doesn't have to be set. In fact, if it is, if that is my perspective, then likely I've stopped growing. I've stopped learning. And that idea is the center of today's episode. I had a chance recently to sit down and talk to David Denham and Jeff Groling. That conversation amongst the three of us looked at where has our understanding of faith integration come from? Who are the voices that have helped to shape that? And where have we seen that perspective grow and evolve? Second part of today's episode is a short conversation that I got to have recently with Dr. Gerald Maxwell, our new provost. These two conversations taken together form a really interesting perspective and conversation regarding where we've been, both individually as faculty and collectively as a university, and where we can go individually and collectively as a university. I'm excited to invite you into my conversation with David Dunham, Jeff Groling, and Gerald Maxwell. Well, David, Jeff, thanks for joining me on the BCTLE podcast. It's great to have you guys here for our conversation today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, So I, I would like to get just a little bit of background uh, before we jump into sort of our conversation about how your perspective on faith integration has evolved over time. Um, I know a little bit about each of your stories, but David, maybe we start with you a little bit. What what was your journey to this point here at Taylor? How What does that look like in higher education? Do you have a lot of experience in uh, Christian higher ed, uh, uh Public higher ed, what's your journey been like to this moment? Well, it certainly has been a journey. Um, personally, I went to all state schools, uh, mm-hmm. my undergrad, both masters, actually here in Indiana, Ball State and IU. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then my, my first library position was at uh, Gardner Webb University, which is a Baptist affiliated university in North Carolina. Okay. Okay. Um, and I was there for uh, about eight, nine years. Okay. And I, I had a, a, a 
kind of an informal mentor there that really mm. first exposed me to the concept of faith integration. Mm. Uh, largely at that time using worldview terminology, mm. um, but that that was very I, I'd say influential. Uh, and then afterwards, I came back to Indiana. I'm actually a native of Grant County. Okay, and because I had uh, you know young children, and my my parents certainly weren't getting any younger, mm. and I took a position at uh, IPFW, Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne, which, of course, no longer no exists. longer exists. Yeah, so it's Purdue, Fort Wayne, and there's a separate IU Med campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was there for about three years. And of course, that's a, a state university secular right. environment. Right. Now, coming to Taylor has been sort of um, the perfect culmination in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I'm very, uh, I have felt the most on board with a mission mm-hmm. here that I, than I ever have in the past. Yeah. Um, I've seen, you know, secular academia and then I've seen Christian academia where faith and learning seem to be on parallel tracks. Not really integrated. Then. Yes. Mm. Um, I knew people who were very interested in faith integration, but there was often pushback Right. So to come to a university where uh, that is actively being promoted mm-hmm. is is very exciting. Yeah. You know that we're teaching not just content, but faith is even going to be influencing our pedagogy, mm-hmm. our approach. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Well, it's exciting. Uh, this is you came at a very interesting point in time. Right? I think uh, sort of smack in the middle of pandemic, right? And so uh, some some faculty, uh, as we've been adjusting wildly to COVID, might see you in meetings and, and, and recognize your face and not be entirely sure where they know you from because of just the way that paths haven't been crossing as often. So I'm glad that we get a chance to chat on the, the, the podcast today. Jeff, you have a slightly different story, right? Um, in that your experience in higher education has tended to toward um, Christian higher ed. Tell me a little bit about sort of your journey and understanding where faith is integrated in higher education. So, David, I, I knew about you, but you didn't know about me. So I think you're going to be a bit surprised here. Uh, <laughs> I, too, am from Indiana, my wife and I. I, too, am a product of public education from elementary school all through my doctorate. Uh, I did my undergrad and my master's at Ball State. And oh. I didn't think you knew that. Uh, and, chirp, chirp. Yeah, yeah, chirp, chirp. And I think, I think I was there before you were, actually, but when I looked at your um, resume. So uh, my undergraduate master's from Ball State, and then I did my doctorate uh, at, at University of Kentucky when I worked at Asbury Seminary. Mm. So, mm. so my work experience has been pretty much exclusively private higher education. So I spent 15 years at Asbury, and, and I'm starting my 15th year here at Taylor. So faith integration-wise, because I, too, was a product of public education, uh, never crossed my mind um, in my educational journey that faith and education could coexist. Uh, it wasn't until I started at Asbury where we began to have those conversations where I started having those conversations. And then I started my doctoral program while I was at the, or while I was at Asbury. Mm -hmm. And when I went up to a highly secular environment and I worked in a Christian environment and people invariably asked me, Oh, you're a part-time student. What do you do? I work at Asbury seminary and it led to conversations about my faith. Mm -hmm. And so I had to integrate it at that point informally into into my learning process because uh, University of Kentucky is um, everything that you think in terms of a public institution of higher education, in terms of viewpoints. And and so it it led to some really good conversations and forced me to think through, you know, why I believe what I believe and um, and how I shared my faith in a way that was non-threatening. So it wasn't until I came to Taylor in 2007 that I really engaged more seriously in the conversation of faith learning integration. And mm-hmm. I came to Taylor as the dean of online learning. And so uh, what was ironic was I was responsible for the training of adjuncts to teach online and mm-hmm. asked them for their perspective on faith integration <laughs> and it helped them develop the perspectives on faith right. integration when I myself, because I was not teaching faculty, 
didn't necessarily have my own. Right. And so as a result of teaching that class, I had to develop one of my own, uh, or at least think through it more formally. So I began that process when I started here in 2007, even though I wasn't teaching faculty, and continued to refine it over the years. In 2012, 2013, I transitioned to vice provost. And so in my application process mm -hmm. for that position, I had to further refine it. And mm -hmm. then this year, uh, I'm up for tenure, and part of the tenure process is the submission of a faith integration paper. And so uh, mm -hmm. I just finished that up. Uh, I've been working on it for the last several years, but I finished it up just last month and submitted it as part of my file. So I can't discount the, the course that Taylor offers that you're going through right now, and I know you went through a mm -hmm. couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, how has that course changed your perspective or 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 maybe it isn't that it's changed something but maybe it's solidified something so what's changed what's stayed the same and, and can you see where those changes or groundings have happened i guess i can go quickly because i'm i'm only i've been three sessions into okay. the class thus far so i'm not going to have quite the experience and longevity of having thought about this as you have um I would say that one of the things it has I've benefited from with this class is while I've said I have some experience with the concept of faith integration, not in any kind of academic study really. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just passed on by a mentor. And I, I feel that um, the class is kind of giving me the language to better express mm -hmm. right these concepts. And uh, to take them from the philosophical level, which you know, I have lots of conversations mm. and such, and I think this is fascinating, and I, I get personally excited about it. But it's like, how do I apply this? How does it operationalize? Yeah, yeah. yeah how do I? And uh, thankfully, in, in addition to the faith integration class, actually, the president and provost invited uh, a lot of us, I think maybe all the new faculty, to do a book study um, on the the book, um, the idea of a Christian college, mm -hmm. uh, Holmes, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, uh, sort of a seminal, you know, classic right. of, of faith learning integration. Yeah. Um, the point that I'm actually seeing it being cited by the articles that we're reading <laughs> in the, the faith integration class. So, mm -hmm. I think it's going to give me uh, an, an academic background mm -hmm. that I don't really have in this topic yet, um, which will then, I think, make my um, actual practice of faith integration yeah. so much more, well, informed mm. and hopefully effective. Right. And that's, that's one thing I think that you will find. I mean, a faith integration paper isn't something that all of a sudden you magically present at the end of this class. <laughs> it's, it's something that you continue to work on and refine over time because as you grow in your understanding of integrating your faith in with your discipline and what you do and how you interact with others, your understanding changes. And, and that's, that's what the class did for me was uh, initially when I started at Taylor, it was an intensely personal thing, uh, mm -hmm. how faith was lived out in my classroom. And, and when, I, when I did the training for adjunct faculty to teach online, I was encouraging them to think about how it was going to look in how they lived it out in the online classroom. So, so it was very much focused on me and my students, but mm -hmm. as, as time has gone on and as I've come in contact with other sources, David, back to that point, you're gonna collect these books that will be given to you through BCTLE and, and people will refer them to you and it's like, that's a book I wanna hang on to. And, and what will happen is you will find that all of these will contribute to how you think and view about not only yourself, but how you live it out. And, and so, I have the luxury of 15 years at Taylor and lots of people who have poured into me in terms of of how I think and how I view what this looks like, not only in my classroom, and that's what I was getting ready to say, is that my understanding of faith integration, it's far broader than just my classroom. It's my discipline. It's my colleagues. It's, it's the university. It's life together at Taylor. And one of my sources that I cite repeatedly in my paper is Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Life Together mm. because faith integration, I mean, if you're loving Jesus and you're loving others, part of that is our life together. And so 
I, I, I use him quite a bit. And I also use, I have a quote from Milo Rediger that made it into my paper uh, because I'm a big Milo fan. Um, but he had a lot of good things to say. And um, it, this was back in 72. He said, ours is a whole person education, academic, spiritual, and social. So he saw the holistic part of what we do here at Taylor. Educators who have taken the position that they are interested only in the mental development of their students have abdicated a major portion of their responsibility for those living and studying in their institutions. That's whole person education. And part of our faith learning integration is directly investing in that formation process. It's interesting hearing some of the voices that are impacting how you're thinking about this, whether it's Bonhoeffer or Holmes or or Milo Milo Rediger, <laughs> uh, I I think I think what that highlights for me is maybe something that felt I don't want to say absurd, but uh, really caught me off guard early doors of of the faith integration course here at Taylor, and that was that this is a this is a discourse. Uh, uh, the integration of faith and learning and education is a is a discourse that I just wasn't aware mm. existed. Um, it felt more personally worked out yes. rather than um, publicly mm-hmm. engaged with. And I would say that most of my perspectives then that I had developed at the time that I w- walked into the course were were intensely personal. Um, it, it, you know, most of the the voices that were speaking into how I saw the integration of faith and learning weren't distinctly. I, I don't even know that they were theistic. They were they were more naturalistic, yeah. um, and um, so seeing that develop as part of the discourse, and seeing that I got to participate in that discourse was was where I saw the the biggest change for me was that it went from something that I was working out personally, individually, mm-hmm. to being part of the conversation, which I I like now. This podcast is sort of a continuation of that as, yep. as we get to engage in conversation together. You mentioned, Jeff, that um, it isn't just your faith and learning, but it's faith and your discipline, it's faith in your pedagogy. As you think about opportunities to interact with students in the classroom, and, and David, help us make a connection to your interactions with students in this question, but um, how do you create opportunities for students to begin to work out for themselves or explore for themselves that integration? that you might not have had in your education experience, but now you're getting to to present that opportunity to students. How do you think about that opportunity? How do I do that in a way that is meaningful? Uh, again, I, I do the devotion at the start of every class, and, and it's generally 10 minutes long, and you know, that's 10 minutes of lecture I'm not doing, but at the same time, it's uh, we, we read Scripture, and then we talk about it. And so you start with you start with faith and then ask so what yeah so what of our content right fits so, here so so i start with scripture yep and then we talk about it mm-hmm. and it's a discussion it isn't just jeff pontificating mm-hmm. to my students or preaching to my students it's a discussion and i want to hear how god is speaking to them through the scripture we just read together mm-hmm. and then Through that conversation, generally, I I draw out over the course of the conversation of our class time together, I'll point back to, and this is where God is speaking through this in Mm. relation to this particular communication concept. Mm. And so we make those connections as we work through it. And in all my classes, as Mackenzie will tell you, I'm always like, how does this apply to you? What is your takeaway from this? I want whatever we're talking about, the communication concept, I want them to be able to see how not only the concept that we're studying applies in their lives both now and after graduation, but also how the spiritual truths that we're talking about in class applies to them 
no, mm. and after graduation. Those are the real takeaways. It's, it's really where are they growing in their faith as we're on this journey together. Is it a balance, though? Sure I, I, I mean, the, I, I, I love Tim Herman's question, and that's where my mind keeps coming back to you, right? But, Jeff, if I took 10 minutes of every class for a devotion, I would, I would feel like I have short-changed the discipline in some way. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it's, I'm not going to dispute that. At the same time, um, y- you always have to balance the, the spiritual with the pragmatics of what's the learning outcomes we're time, trying to achieve. And as long as we have those learning outcomes in mind, how you navigate your particular lecture unit content that you're delivering in light of making time for the devotion is, is a balance that you have to navigate from class to class. Okay, so so okay, so it isn't just a uh, devotion. It's a it's an objective. The devotions are not a, a specific learning outcome of my class. Okay. This is a this is a spiritual outcome. Okay. And, and in my mind, why are we here? I mean, if, if we're not making disciples for the 21st century mm. as part of this educational process, mm. why are we here? What's the point? I mean, we might as well be over at Ball State or at Kentucky or PFW or wherever mm. teaching in a secular institution. Mm. And so I don't make it an explicit, explicit outcome but it is implicit in everything I teach. Mm. has to be. I mean, it, the mission of Taylor University is to... It's the ministry, mission of Taylor University. To minister develop, Christ or... De- you know, nope. develop oh, no, I've got leaders, it. <laughs> develop servant leaders marked with a passion to minister Christ's redemptive love and truth to a world in need. Yep. And so that mission statement guides everything we do here at Taylor, including what I'm doing in my classroom. Sure. So, so that's the outcome I'm trying to achieve, right? whether or not it's specifically in my syllabus or not. I got there. <laughs> it took me a minute. Listeners of the there. podcast will remember <laughs> that uh, uh, we did a three-part mini-series on the uh, mission statement. I was talking about it for weeks on end with our guests, and I couldn't mm. even remember it when found in the moment. So I've had 15 years of practice. There so, you go. Yeah. So, David, how are you hearing this idea of in the classroom? Because I know that that looks different for you as the academic engagement librarian. Uh, Yes, a lot of times it's a matter of sort of translating um, the ideas to my specific context, which, of course, uh, is always going to be a part of faith integration Mm -hmm. because it's not going to be one set of this is exactly how we do faith integration. Mm-hmm. I mean, the articles we're reading talk about it's going to look different depending on the discipline, yep. mm-hmm. depending upon the context, who you're working with. Um, you know, even in his ministry, it seemed like Christ was always so good at like customizing yes. his message to exactly who he was talking to and who needed to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to think that maybe I don't have the opportunity to have a class that I'm doing a devotion with on a daily basis because mm-hmm. I'm my role is often to support other instructors. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not necessarily generating content, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm going in and uh, telling them how to find resources, how to evaluate resources. Mm-hmm. And, of course, um, if we're aiming for truth and information literacy is certainly a part of that because we're bombarded with so many um, sources of varying quality, varying levels of truth, mm-hmm. um, even even using fuzzy uh, truth in a fuzzy way, we're still lots of different levels of that. Mm. Um, so I would like in the future to continue uh, integrating faith in a more explicit way, but I like that you also use, Jeff, the word implicit, Mm -hmm. um, because I think there can be a danger in assuming that all expressions of faith have to be explicit. Mm, Um, You know, since the Enlightenment, there's been this constant tendency to separate the mind and and faith, faith and reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And you'll hear people sometimes, I'm sure anybody who's met Taylor a long time and talked to Christian students has heard 
people say things along the lines of like, well, yeah, I was, I wanted to be a doctor or I wanted to be a lawyer, but I decided I wanted to serve God. So I'm going to go <laughs> uh-huh. into Christian ministry, you know, <laughs> explicitly. <laughs> uh, it, it's sort of like, wait, it, you can serve God by, mm. if, if all knowledge and all aspects of the world are God's, then mm-hmm. being, simply being a Christian, being someone with the Holy Spirit and doing these things is 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 serving God. Right. So I'd like to hope that um, in in my interactions with students one on one, you know, uh, my meetings with students, that hopefully I'm expressing uh, a compassion, mm-hmm. a, uh, an understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, it's a dialogue. It's an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And I, I, I really am excited to talk to other professors and have opportunities like this because I'm sure there are so many opportunities that are going to p- come up that I have never mm-hmm. even thought of. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, that idea of opportunities also makes me think about this idea of how do we do this with students. There are certainly times where it is planned where I've built into a syllabus, here is the clear opportunity. I think of um, CAC 160, Integrative Communication, the Foundational Core Comm class. The the first assignment that we do is called Humans of Taylor, where students go have five meaningful conversations with strangers. And one of the explicit objectives of the assignment is that students would consider – how they honor the image of the creator in the people that they then present to their faculty. They take a picture, they take a quote from the conversation, and then that's how they represent that person to me, their instructor. But there's an objective that I want them thinking about how have they honored that image of the creator in the strangers that they're talking to. That's that's planned. I know that's going to happen. I know that opportunity is there. But then there's, then there are the opportunities that emerge that I can't plan for. You know, a student who comes into my office who says, you know, I'm really troubled by something you said in class because that doesn't fit with what I believe is true about God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't plan for that opportunity right. to be there, right? Mm-hmm. Or the student who says, you know, I'm, I think I, I. I, I'm going to go to law school, but now I'm starting to wonder if that's, you know, God's plan for my life. You know, that God's plan for your life or law school are not in my discipline, but that's an opportunity that I get to, to talk about. Here's my perspective on, on that idea of, of there it's faith integrated into your life, your idea of calling. Mm-hmm. And, and I can share my perspective explicitly or in the classroom implicitly as I talk about, you know, my own journey. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't one thing and it isn't, Mm -hmm. it isn't always the planned thing, right? Sometimes it is that emerging opportunity that uh, can knock me flat on my backside if I'm not, if I'm not willing to go there, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about our faith perspective integrated in what we've been been doing and how we've seen that evolve over time. Um, as you think about sort of what you're seeing right now, what does it look like is coming down the pike for you in terms of where you see faith and integration in learning or pedagogy or, or discipline? What are you what are you seeing or thinking about now that feels like a new direction? Is there anything? Well, I think that we are on the cusp of a lot here at Taylor. I mean, this is the first year we've had in a while that's resembled any level of normalcy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've had additional changes in my area mm-hmm. because we had um, our original director retired mm-hmm. uh, after the end of the spring 2020 semester Mm -hmm. and because of covid and enrollment and Mm -hmm. monetary issues we had to uh kind of put that on hold Mm -hmm. and we had uh uh, lana wilson took over as the 
acting director and did a spectacular job, mm-hmm. but we always knew that that was going to end. That, you know, was that we were going to mm-hmm. be getting a new director, and um, so there was a lot that was up in the air. In addition to everything that was up in the air for the university, but. I, I like to feel that with the new president and provost coming in and the things that they're saying and the vision they seem to have that we're, we're maybe kind of coming out of, you know, going over the hump and uh, turning a corner, whatever metaphor you want right. to use. Uh, but I think, I mean, good things are in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and being in this class at this time, mm-hmm. being in this discussion – it's like a lot of things are coming together and gelling. Mm. Um, so again, being vague, but I'm very <laughs> excited about the possibilities yeah. coming. You know, it seems like every few years I keep coming back to this paper and there's something to add and something to change mm-hmm. and something to update depending on what's going on mm-hmm. either in my life or the life of the university or, or whatever, or some new question comes to mind that I want to get in writing. And so I, bring my paper back out or add something else to it, some source. I was like, ah, I want to get that in my mm-hmm. paper. Uh, I have three questions that um, that kind of form the outline of my paper that I, that I want to, over time, drill down more into. Mm. Uh, because I, you know, a good faith integration paper is a done faith integration paper. And so <laughs> uh, I, I, in the interest of time and length, I kind of cut it off, but but uh, but I would like to explore these mm. three questions further. And so one of them is, how does my faith impact the understanding of Christian liberal arts education? So that's the first question. And the second question is, how does this understanding of my faith impact life together at Taylor? Mm. And then the third question is, is, how does my faith and discipline impact my teaching at Taylor and my students? And so each of those... Uh, I want to spend more time reflecting on and collecting more recent, having more conversations. Uh, but where it's at right now is is good enough, mm-hmm. and I gotta let it go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, we started this conversation by sort of reflecting on the journey to this point, and what I have appreciated so much is the opportunity to hear your perspectives on this. Um, I think that. If I can draw the red thread, that's what makes this university, the BCTLE, this podcast meaningful is that conversation about important things. There's a space for it Mm -hmm. and that there's something to celebrate from a spiritual understanding that conversation. Um, So, Jeff, David, thanks for being a part of the conversation today. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for, for having, having us. us. Yeah. I'm excited for the return this week of uh, a segment we started last semester on the podcast, New Faculty Voices. Our new faculty voice this week is that of Dr. Margaret Shazara, Assistant Professor of Economics. I encourage you to reach out to Margaret, get to know her, stop by her office and read, uh, send her an email. You know, I got to have a chance to talk to our new faculty last summer, and I remember my conversation with Margaret as we dove into not just her content area, but where she sees her faith integrated into her content. The other thing about our culture that is just so um, significant and, and visible is the idea of faith and learning Integration of faith and lesson, yeah. 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 Have you spent much time thinking about how, where you see yourself entering into that space of, of faith and learning? I, I've heard you reference several times already the, the opportunity to engage students in that way mm-hmm. and what God was doing in your life while you were a student. Have you thought about now as a faculty how you're entering into that space? Yeah, so integration of faith and learning... Um, for me, as uh, an economist coming to teach economics, uh, it's not just going to be theoretical because I, like, pedagogically, the approaches that I use, uh, I use reflective learning and um, integrative, actually, approach, whereby 
whatever we are learning, we have to relate it to everyday life. Mm-hmm. Yes, theory is important, but also how does that apply to our lives today and how uh, does that apply? How, where do we find it in the word of God? I can say, for example, right now, I've been working on my micro class. Uh, I'm teaching both principles of microeconomics and intermediate uh, mm-hmm. microeconomics. So the first thing that we, we look at is what is economics? Where does the word economics come from? From Greek, it mm-hmm. means, you know, managing a household for somebody. So ha- what is the biblical perspective on that? Where do we trace it from? And we, if we look at in the Bible, we look at Joseph, you know, managing the house for Potiphar. And if we look at um, God himself, when he created the world, right, uh, he created men so that he could take care of, manage uh, his creation. And then, um, so it's so easy to integrate it, my faith, what I believe the Bible say with economic principles. And then uh, we look of, we are finite creation. And then, um, so I have been really enjoying doing that prayer and uh, you know, yeah. as I prepare That's for great. my classes. Well, Gerald, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the BCTLE podcast. It's great to have you as our guest for this episode. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. So I remember when uh, you were first introduced to faculty, mm-hmm. that first faculty meeting. Um, and as we all have gotten to know you a little bit and sort of see where your, uh, your passions lie within higher education, um, and thinking about what makes Taylor unique. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions that, um, I'm really interested to learn about, um, is your time in the classroom teaching full time. Sure. Uh, I know a little bit about that, um, uh, at some of the institutions you've been at previously, but I also know that faith integration is something that's really important to you. Right, so right. I, I'm, I guess I'm curious about um, where these two things meet. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, what your perspective on faith integration has looked like from the classroom perspective? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that was probably most important for me, even just thinking about faith integration was the first time I, I was involved in a, a, another Christ-centered institution, and it was the first time I was even going through any sort of training with regards to faith integration, that there was an individual who he had been teaching for over 40 years, had been kind of this stalwart at that institution for faith integration, and he made this comment that you never fully arrive. And it was more of this idea that if you understand integration of faith and learning, it is a continual process. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that, that that certainly guided me early on in my career uh, to be thinking, first of all, uh, it, 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 was, it was kind of this initiation process um, where I got the job there. Mm-hmm. And before I even arrived, I think I was sent a reading list of about 10 books that I needed to get through. Wow. Yeah, they, they took it seriously, which I appreciated, <laughs> though. Uh, and so I think that that really just informed the way I thought about it in terms of, uh, one, I had to build a foundation because I had, uh, I had attended secular schools. I had taught at secular mm-hmm. schools. So, so this was my first time really engaging with material, but then, mm-hmm. um, it became this process for me because I think as a believer, I realized some of what I was doing in my classrooms even at secular institutions, included elements of my own faith mm. and included, if we're saying, art, we have Art Holmes who, who talks about all truth is God's truth. Mm. If I was instilling truths into my classes, right. then clearly I was being informed right. by um, truths that had been established by God. Right. So um, my uh, a little bit about my background. So I, I had taught at a couple of institutions for short periods of time, then had been at uh, Cedarville University for five and a half years mm-hmm. teaching, took on some administrative responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And so it was during that period that I would say that I 
I really grew the most because it was almost um, the entire time there was full time mm -hmm. uh, teaching and uh, just really had some great mentors who helped me along in the process. And then what was really exciting for me was whenever I accepted a job at Gordon and was a dean at Gordon for a while, I one of my responsibilities was working with our uh, first and second year faculty as they thought about faith integration. Okay. So uh, that allowed me to, to kind of take, I guess it would be the next level in terms of my own understanding yeah. because um, I felt at, at first probably I wasn't ready. And so then I, I took a, a summer where I, I tried to get as much reading in as possible. Yeah. Um, so that, that does that give you a little bit of background that you were? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it makes me think about how for many of us who have experience in uh, non-faith-based institutions, mm -hmm. that we do a lot of our spiritual growth uh, and then our intellectual or, or disciplinary growth. Sure, sure. And then at some point, maybe it's when we come to a place like Taylor, we start to look at where those two intersect. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then it seems like there is this, uh, there's this trajectory from that point on where the continued growth in our faith and the mm -hmm, continued mm -hmm, growth mm -hmm. in our discipline make that um, integration I think I feel a little bit more natural because we've already done a lot of the hard work of taking two things that maybe we were taught were separate sure. and, 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 and finding those, those crossovers as you think about in leadership mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and how you think strategically in, in your vision for Taylor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I know you've only been here for a minute, so I'm not asking <laughs> you to, to critique anything right, right. Or, or to to evaluate. But as you think about the future as, as provost, mm -hmm. how has that experience uh, of going through that yourself and then also leading first and second year faculty through that, how, how are you thinking about that in terms of your time here at Taylor? Great question. Uh, I would say... For me, the reason why it's so important is I do think that it, it's what makes institutions like Taylor distinct. Yeah. And I also know that we, we like to use that language and, mm -hmm. because we could say, well, there's over 150 CCCU institutions. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I do think that if you really analyze what's going on at the respective institutions, mm -hmm. there are clearly some that, that take integration of faith and learning um, more seriously than others. And I think that uh, as we think about our own future, the reason why I think it, it is so critical is if we look at the type of reputation that Taylor has and the spiritual growth that definitely prospective students and their, their families are looking for, mm -hmm. Taylor has a great reputation in terms of student development. And so it's happening outside of the classroom, or at least right. that's the, the perception. And so I think that uh, the, the idea that um, we need to also, as, as faculty or in the academic uh, area, really um, take this seriously and, and, and to think that this is going to be so critical for the students in their, their own development and, and I think that it gives me real hope because I think that there will continue to be families, there will continue to be prospective students who really just value uh, institutions that, that feel that this is a driving force of, of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, again, if we are just looking at it from a theoretical perspective, and again, if we use something like Holmes and the idea of a Christian college or, or some of the other um, texts that, that are, are kind of front and center in that, that faith yeah. integration. If we believe what, what ha has been argued in the past, this is what we ought to be about. And if, again, going back to that simple truth that all truth is God's truth, then uh, I'm not sure how we could be successful as an institution if we weren't saying we're going to be Christ-centered, liberal arts institution, and the two actually go hand in hand because you have this common creator, and now we're trying to encourage students to understand the world from multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. through multiple disciplines, 
But what was kind of that light bulb moment for me early on in my career was to say, well, of course it, it, it makes sense because you have a common creator in mm. all of that. So that, that would, um, as I look forward, and I think that that's kind of what your, your question is about is it, it's really, how can we honor our past? How can we honor our Lord mm. and, and really just look at how are we preparing students or how are we preparing graduates to go out into the world mm. and have that positive influence for Christ? You've mentioned Holmes a couple of times. Yeah. I'm curious about some of the voices that have inspired and informed how you think about faith integration. Um, was there, in your experience at secular institutions in, in undergrad and mm -hmm. uh, graduate work, was there? did you have someone who was that voice to help you see that connection that you're just talking about in undergraduate and graduate sure, school? Sure. No. So the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so whenever I was, that's where it was when I got the job at Cedarville mm -hmm. that that's where there was kind of that, that push, mm -hmm. but that's where I, as I just said a, a minute or two ago, kind of that light bulb moment of, yeah. so my undergraduate institution was Muskingum college. Mm -hmm. It's now Muskingum university in Ohio. And I, I felt like I got a great, what we would consider to be liberal arts mm -hmm. curriculum, liberal arts experience. I thought the the faculty were dynamic. I, I, I definitely learned a lot. And I think I, I got that experience that we would say uh, is really enriching mm -hmm. and, and has that, that purely liberal arts tradition in it. But then it was whenever I first started reading some texts that focus much more on faith integration that I would, that's whenever I was saying, well, it makes a lot more sense whenever you are looking at it from a faith perspective of having that common creator who has established these truths across all disciplines. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, I think that one of the things that was enlightening for me in my own experience was to, as I said earlier, I think there were times whenever I, I, I wasn't as overt in, in terms of here is is my faith and mm. although I, I was able to share from a personal side at times but I, I think in terms of the discipline or the courses that I was mm. teaching mm -hmm. I wasn't putting it out front but I think that there were elements that I was already doing it I just didn't know that I was doing it <laughs> uh, sure yeah with sort of the well I think when that's who you are we teach out of who we are. Sure. Right. Sure. And so it might come out in ways that we're not anticipating right. it to, to come out. Yeah. And I think that mine, my experience too. So the other institutions that I haven't mentioned, my first institution that I taught at, it was also a small liberal arts college in Southwestern Virginia. So it's Emory and Henry college. Mm -hmm. And one of the classes that I had the opportunity to teach was the introduction to the Western tradition. And so it was this okay. core class, basically a, a Western Civ class that faculty from a, a variety of disciplines taught. All mm -hmm. first year students had to take the class. There were only 15 students in the class. And so we were dealing with issues of uh, what is true, good, beautiful. And there were even elements of scripture that were in those classes. Mm -hmm. Now we were also looking at um, texts that, that were from outside of the evangelical or outside of the Christian uh, realm. Mm. And, and But it gave me the opportunity to share my faith a bit more yeah. because it was, it was almost like fair game because if we're going to... So one of the things that, that we read in that class was the creation account and, mm. and then also the fall of man. So we're, we're talking Genesis 1, 2, 3. Yeah. And so... I gave my own perspective, even though I knew that I was, at, even at the time, I knew I was teaching it in a different perspective than what some of my colleagues mm -hmm. would have been. Mm -hmm. um, so that it probably was a bit easier for me because of the types of institutions that I was a part of as well. Hmm. Well, it's interesting you bring up some of these institutions. Yeah. Um, Taylor is in a, well, I, I've been told it's a unique season. Mm -hmm. This is my fourth year. Yeah. And so um, uh, each year as things happen, uh, I'm often told by faculty who have been here for a long time, this isn't normal. Mm -hmm. um, and I will believe it when when there's a year that isn't, sure, isn't sure. this. 
not to say that I'm pessimistic, but mm -hmm. I, there's a there's this point in time that we're at here yeah. at Taylor, and it's one that could be defined, categorized in many different ways. But one of the ways that we've heard it defined is a season where there's um, in, in lots of ways a lack of trust in the community, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've seen that a, a little bit in some of the survey data that's been talked about through uh, discovery sessions and listening sessions. Um, and I am, I'm really hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I, as I talk to other faculty, um, I, I sense that same hopefulness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the, the conversations around building trust are, are going somewhere, are leading to, to something that there will be some tangible fruit of this labor that we're going through. Sure. I just don't know that I've ever seen it done well mm -hmm. um, at, at an organizational level. I can look at interpersonal relationships mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or family relationships, and I can say, I think I've seen it done well here. Have you seen at an organizational level that process of building trust? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that done well? Mm. I would probably agree with you. I don't know if I could reference a specific institution or organization mm -hmm. that really had to focus their attention um, on the building of trust. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the closest thing that I could think of would be, I, I had left the church at that point uh, because I had relocated, mm -hmm. but I knew of a church that I had been a part of that the pastor had to step down because of some personal um, reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, there was that question of, I mean, what happened? So this was an individual who he was the assistant pastor when the church was planted. Then he became the lead pastor, had been the lead pastor for probably at least 15 years mm -hmm. or so. And so it was very abrupt. And and so I, I saw it from afar. I mm -hmm. think that you you certainly had a community that, I mean, they're still going through it right now, but, but I think that, that that's really what they've emphasized. I think to your point, uh, and, and perhaps we don't, have great examples of at an organizational level. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we, my perspective is mm -hmm. when we think about trust, when we think about relationships, uh, it really is, it, it does have to boil down to one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. relationships. And uh, it, it's almost that as you, you think about how my being led by the spirit and we, we can't look so far in advance to say in five years, I want to do this or in 10 years, I want to do this. It, it's day to day and mm -hmm. it, it's one day at a time. And so if not, this is kind of taking us off of, of the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll return. I'll circle back okay. here in a minute. Um, but I, I really am a believer in that if we yield to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I think that we will draw closer uh, mm -hmm. to Christ and that we will be led by the Spirit each day. Mm -hmm. But that's different than saying, I'm going to commit to doing that for the next two years. Day to day is a lot simpler. Right. And the same would be true if, if I would think about as an organization tries to develop trust or building community, mm -hmm. it really is those you referenced interpersonal relationships and, and you, you've seen it happen there. I think it is incumbent upon all of us that it's that who, who's in front of you at the given moment mm. and really establishing those relationships. And if, if we're able to make progress on the five people that we interacted with today, mm. we built a little bit of trust and then it might be five mm. different people tomorrow. I think that it's the accumulation over time. Mm. And I'd like to say that it, it's simple and I'd like to say that it happens quickly, <laughs> but I also realize that, I can't gain someone else's trust by never having a conversation with them or, or kind of being mm. um, further removed from them. And, and, and nor can I, I expect that individuals are going to uh, trust other individuals on campus if they don't ever interact with them. Right. So I think it is a, a, a process. I think that we can, uh, we can be mindful of trying to communicate better, communicate more, try to um, be as 
and, and I know this is a cliche, but be as transparent as possible. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that over time, uh, again, as you said, I'm very hopeful. And, and I think that we're in a season where as we look ahead, um, there, there's certainly reasons for hope. Well, and what I appreciate in that, Gerald, is that um, that idea of uh, transparency, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, As I listen to faculty who have been here a lot longer than I have, um, some of the the hurt or mistrust that may have built up prior to to my joining the, the team here seems to commonly be referred to as that lack of transparency. What? where does the LTC stop? Does it stop at a certain level in the organization or not? Are we all saying we're going to make allowances for one another? Do we all say that we're going to assume the best, that we're going to give the most generous interpretation? Do we, where does that stop? And at some point, I think um, we, we have to, we have to say um, that that we are going to that community that our students value so deeply. Mm -hmm. Um, we are, we're going to, we're going to intentionally lean in, in the same ways. Sure. Sure. Um, just as we could define the season as a season for building trust. Mm -hmm. I think another way that we could define the season and it's, I think a recent development I would say is, um, integrity, Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. which is absolutely related. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um, but the clearest example to me of this was the service of lament and thanksgiving um, that we had on on the seventh, um, where um, it was clear. I think in my conversations with colleagues, it was clear that our faith center was not being used for an organizational function, but rather our faith was what we were centering on. Mm. And we were trusting that as we engaged with one another faithfully, that the other pieces of the why Mm -hmm. that we're here, those follow. Mm -hmm. Those follow our our spiritual center. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, to me, I saw a lot of integrity in terms of our when we say we are integrating faith into what we do, mm-hmm. it isn't, it, it doesn't stop the, the life together covenant doesn't stop. We choose to do that. Sure. Um, as, as you think through sort of where we're going and you have mm-hmm. a perspective that mm-hmm. uh, a lot of us might not have in terms of thinking about the strategic plan, but I, I wonder if you can help us see where that, spiritual center that of integration of faith and learning faith in pedagogy faith in leadership how that's guiding where mm-hmm. we're going uh so the one thing i'll say I, I wish i would have prepared better uh for this this question um you were saying all of that and it reminded me back to my undergraduate days and i remember that it was a t-shirt that the senior class put together. And uh, I don't remember what was the front of the t-shirt, but the the back of the t-shirt said that there was a quote in it. And that's where I don't remember who the individual was, but mm-hmm. it said, uh, you can only lead where others will follow. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that, that that would be true in terms of yes, we can be very optimistic and I am. And I think other individuals on senior leadership team would be very optimistic in terms of a strategic plan Mm -hmm. and where we're moving. We can be optimistic in terms of we have an alumni community, uh, um, those who have supported us either through financial resources or through prayer who are actively engaged with us right now. Mm -hmm. And, And that's all critical. However, I think that what, uh, the perspective that I would have, what we need to be doing right now and what we tried to do throughout late fall and now as we're into January and February is I, I've appreciated the way Will Hagen has talked about it in terms of this is the season of listening. Mm. And so with the strategic plan, trying to get as many voices into the process as possible, mm. that includes being on campus, that includes we've done an event in Indianapolis, in Dallas, in 
Florida. There's going to be one in Chicago. So engaging with alumni who are in, in the respective areas. Mm-hmm. And so I think it is just really trying to soak in as much information as possible mm-hmm. and uh, being able to respond then uh, because there are going to be conversations in the future where someone might ask the question of, well, here was one idea or here was one initiative that we really thought would would be a great initiative for Taylor and we, we chose not to include mm-hmm. it in the plan. Well, why? Well, I think we've made progress just in at least hearing mm-hmm. those up front and now we're going to have to be in the situation where we respond and mm-hmm. there could be a variety of factors for that. Um, but I, I think getting back to your, your question then, it's the... I think it really is leaning into the community as a whole and recognizing that whole idea. Again, you can't lead where where others aren't following. Mm -hmm. And so how are we ensuring that there there is continual communication? It's it's a two-way street in terms of the communication. And again, trying to be as open with with individuals as possible. Again, I'll, I'll give Will uh, credit for this, but Will has said it in a lot of the strategic con- strategic planning conversations where he says, um, there's been a lot of, a lot of people on campus have identified areas where they think that we need to improve upon. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be a lot of an agreement on the areas to improve upon, but sometimes the solutions are at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. And so someone is going to be upset in the long run. But I, again, I think that it's the, the way you go about the process itself that can help get us to the point where we do feel like Mm -hmm. we can come together as a community, even if we're not going to be a hundred percent satisfied with, with every initiative that's in the plan. Yeah. It's that humility and integrity that I think, um, you know, just to, to, Take it to its simplest, even uh, I would say um, childlike mm. uh, root that, um, you know, saying you're sorry, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. At such a young age, sure. right? We're teaching our kids this. And yet at some point, even in a Christian organization, a faith based institution, that starts to feel. Um, threatening if i say sorry what am i apologizing for how much control am i giving up um and and to hear you know in an email about whether classes had been uh virtual classes were an option on a snow day to to hear you know sorry about that Mm -hmm. or to hear you know uh on the from the stage of chapel an apology about things that have happened i think that that rings true of that humility and integrity that Mm -hmm. even if my solution isn't the solution that ends up being marched forward as part of the strategic plan or or the future Mm -hmm. the trust that's being built through that humility and integrity i think is is vital Mm -hmm. to that process of community sure sure um half hours too short a time uh, to unpack everything. I really have enjoyed, um, you know, getting to hear from you, getting to know you a little bit, both during this conversation and where I've seen you on campus. I, I look forward to, to more conversations, but thanks for being a part of this conversation. No, thank you. Podcast. I appreciate it. And I look forward to more conversations, perhaps on podcasts, but also just um, on campus. And I, I appreciate even just some of the comments that you made in as you think about, um, it, it has in your four years being told that it, it's not always like this and you're, you're waiting to see whenever that's going to actually occur, but then still coming out at the end of saying, well, there's something about the current period that we're in that there is some hope. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, um, I'll give my last shout out to, to Tom Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the things that, uh, he had, had, um, in a, a communication with the board back in October, uh, he that was the word that he used was hopeful, and mm. um, I think that that's where we're at right now. And and now there's that anticipation for for what is to come. Um, but I, I think it, uh, we're moving in the positive direction. So thanks for l- allowing me to share some of my thoughts with you today. Absolutely, you're more than welcome. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. 
If you're looking for ways to get in touch with us, you can always email bctlepodcast at taylor.edu. The podcast is made possible by the BD Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence and is edited and produced by Mackenzie Dorico. At the BCTLE, our mission is to encourage and equip our faculty in their calling as teachers, care for students, and designs for learning. We want you to know we see what you do for your students. We appreciate and value your contribution to the conversation. We hope that this podcast helps you to make Monday just a little bit better.